I launch into a discussion of the book itself, um, I want to pose some questions to you guys just to mull over in your own mind. Um, because it will provide some of the groundwork for some of the myths that the book tries to dispel. One of the first things you can think about is, have I or anyone I've known ever quit an exercise program because of the time commitment involved? Or for that matter, even failed to embark upon an exercise program because you knew you wouldn't have the time? Another question to think about is, have I ever quit an exercise program because I became tired, worn out, or injured by the program itself? This is a good one for the females in particular to mull over in their mind. Have I ever cut back to a 1,200 calorie a day diet and not lost body fat? Or have I ever gone on a very drastic diet, like one of these liquid protein diets that are medically supervised, lost a significant amount of weight, and then gained it all back and then some? Another thing to think about. Have you ever purchased a piece of exercise equipment off an infomercial? And if the answer to that question is yes, is it now sto stored underneath your bed or do you use it to hang clothes on? Okay. Um, have you ever been a member of a health club? And if so, have you found yourself circling around the parking lot looking for the closest parking space so you can get out and go get on the treadmill? Okay. Have you ever stayed in a hotel and taken the elevator to go up and get on their stair stepper? These are all things that we do because our popular notions of exercise are fairly severely flawed. But it's not necessarily our fault. This can be due to certain thinking errors that are discussed in the book. Now keep those questions sort of milling about in your mind and we'll talk about what the premise of the book is. And the premise of the book is actually on the cover. And I didn't select the subtitle. The, the marketing and editing people at McGraw-Hill did but it actually turns out quite nice, even if not on purpose. It says, a research-based program for strength training, bodybuilding, and complete fitness in 12 minutes a week. So if we break that down piece by piece, we'll take the first part, which says that it's research-based. Everything that we put forth in the book is supported by scientific peer-reviewed literature. And this wasn't really possible to do, except within about the past five years. And the reason for that is, is exercise got knocked significantly off track by a couple of events. One was the publishing of the book and the extreme contagion um, surrounding Kenneth Cooper's aerobics book in the 1970s. Coupled with the fact that most research that was done in exercise physiology during that period of time was on steady state activity because the only measurement tool they had, VO2 max testing, that was the only measurement tool they had, and the only thing suitable for that tool was performing steady state activity on a treadmill or an ergometer or something of that nature. So in combination with a fairly popular form of exercise, there was also um, an explosion of research that supported that as a means of enhancing health. Now the second part of the title says Strength Training, Bodybuilding, and Complete Fitness. And most people, when they hear those three things, and I think probably when we put it on the cover, they were thinking of that as three separate entities. And what we want to point out to people is that those three things are one and the same thing. The only way that you can do any of those three things is by performing mechanical work with muscle. That is the essence of exercise. And the higher the quality of that mechanical work, the better the exercise stimulus and the better you can affect all the subsystems of your body. Your cardiac system, your vascular system, respiratory system, and your metabolic subsystems. The higher the quality of the mechanical work with muscle, the more you can get at those systems to produce beneficial adaptations. And then the last part is in 12 minutes a week. Now, on the cover of a book, that sounds very much like a marketing ploy or simply a promotional tactic. But what we try to do in the book is to demonstrate with the scientific literature that this is not just something that you can get away with. It's not just a way of manipulating the variables where you can give people something that's marketable. It is actually a requirement for the production of best results. 
So the premise of the book on the cover is what we'll develop as we go along. But I want you to keep the questions that we asked at the beginning to, to mill them about in your head because in order to let go of your assumptions that made you answer yes to some of those questions, we first have to find a face-saving way to let go of our preconceived notions. And the best way to do that is to understand how we make mistakes in our thinking. Our thinking is really built for survival, not for truth. That's how we made it as a species, is our thinking is really programmed to be very efficient and to draw premature conclusions so that we don't spend too much time deliberating about whether to run from the saber-toothed tiger or not, so to speak. And that's wired into us. And the natural mistake of thinking is something called heuristics. And basically what heuristics says is we like to try to tell stories to ourselves to explain observed phenomenon in our environment. And two books that discuss this in beautiful detail are by a fellow named Nassim Taleb. And he wrote two books. One is called Fooled by Randomness. And these are available in this store if you want to pick them up. And another is called The Black Swan, The Impact impact of the highly improbable. And it details some of these thinking errors. But in terms of fitness, I'll give you some particular examples of that. And one of them is actually mentioned in the book The Black Swan, and he titles it The Swimmer's Body. And you'll hear this all the time. You'll hear someone say, I'm going to take up swimming because I want the long, lean body of a swimmer. I'm going to take up swimming because I want to look like Michael Phelps, not Arnold Schwarzenegger. And the built-in assumption, which is easy to make, is that this person looks like this because they partake in that activity. When what has actually happened is that person is gravitated towards that activity because he possesses the best body type for that activity. And if you ever want to prove it to yourself, just go to collegiate swim meet and watch the thing unfold during the day. During the early qualifier rounds, you look at the starting blocks and you will see a very good variety of different body types up on the starting line. But as you prog progress through the quarterfinals and the semifinals, people start to look a lot more alike. And by the final, what you'll see is a lineup of what look like physical clones. Because the selective pressure of competition acted as accelerated evolution and selected out the best body type for that activity. Another way that um, we make the mistake of the swimmer's body is the celebrity association. All over this country, thousands upon thousands of women are doing yoga because Madonna does yoga. Okay? Any celebrity can endorse any variety of exercise program and create a huge viral contagion for that without any real good evidence to say whether this really does work for the populace as a whole or not. Which underlines how most exercise programs are marketed. Um, there's the spokesperson's body. During the middle portion of my tenure running this business downtown, one of the most frequent questions I got was about Ty Bo. And the reason slick marketing and very inspirational infomercial is the creator of it will look at him, look at his body. When in fact, he's a very genetically blessed person. And his body is much more a result of his genetic blessing than of any exercise program that he was trying to sell to someone. But again, we can make that mistake of the swimmer's body or the celebrity body and then if that message is presented enough times in a broad enough venue, then contagion takes over and it's a huge thing. <laughs> Just one of the many ways in which we can get misled and that's covered under a chapter in the book called Whom Can You Trust?